to see everybody here this morning. Thanks for joining us for worship on this beautiful Lord's Day. Thankful for the rain we got yesterday and the cooler weather, and we're not uh, overheating today. So, but thank you for joining us. Um, handful of announcements. We are planning to uh, pick back up our Bible study on Sunday night, starting tonight. We have been going through the Heidelberg Catechism uh, for a number of months. We had a hiatus due to a some pandemic that was happening, anybody heard about that? <laughs> but uh, we're going to pick that back up, Lord willing, tonight, and we're going to pick back up with questions uh, 105 through 107, which is in the section dealing with Ten Commandments, and this is the question, these are the questions that deal with the, ten, the excuse me, with the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not murder, uh, which, you know, it's, it's funny, sometimes you go through those kind of topics uh, in Bible studies, and it feels hypothetical, like, you know, nobody here will do that, and you turn on the news, and all you see is murder, and you wonder why that's the case. People don't fear God, but uh, that'll be a good time tonight at 6 o'clock. We're probably going to meet in this room instead of the foyer, just so we can spread the chairs out a little bit uh, further. But please feel free to join us for that. Um, prayer meeting every Friday at 7 in the morning at the church office. If you would like to join us for prayer, please do. If you're not comfortable praying out loud, that's okay. You can just sit with us and pray, and we'll spread the chairs out as much as we need to. Uh, if you make it uh, too many people there... It'll be a good problem to have, and we'll find some other place to do it. But so far, that has not been the case. Uh, one of the things I neglected last Sunday, I know many people haven't met Marilyn. Uh, I, we've, she's been playing for us for the last three months. Her first Sunday that she showed up, she actually played for us. Uh, we, our pianist was sick, and she literally walked up and sat down and played. And uh, But since we were streaming it for so long, I sort of got so used to seeing her there that I forgot that... Many of you hadn't met her, so uh, Marilyn Palmer is our, our new pianist, and she's helping along with Barbara. Um, so we have uh, her and Barbara to play for us, and she's been kind enough to fill in this whole time while we've been stuck doing it on the internet. But uh, anyway, please say, say hi to her afterward. Uh, quick reminder, with all the um, restrictions and things that are going on, uh, before hugging and handshaking, make sure the person is okay with it. Uh, if, they, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. We're not requiring it. But uh, make sure that you don't uh, shake hands if somebody's not okay with it and all that kind of thing. Well, if I can ask you to stand for our call to worship. Our call to worship is the shortest psalm in the whole book of Psalms. It's Psalm 117. Psalm 117 here, God's call to worship. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us and his faithfulness and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our time this morning. Our great triune God and Savior, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, all the nations will praise you, Lord, even now they are coming uh, to be made disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and learning to praise him. Lord, all peoples will praise you one day in heaven. There will be a multitude so vast, no, no one could number that will be praising you for your steadfast love to us in Christ, and you are Worthy of all praise from the rising of the sun to his setting for your steadfast love towards us in Jesus Christ is so great and your faithfulness to us in him endures forever. Heavenly Father, help us to worship you in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit working within us. May you be greatly pleased and glorified by all that we do in this place for we ask all these things in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, if you can remain standing, our first hymn is number 572, uh, the Gloria Patri, or uh, also known as Glory Be to the Father. Oh! 
Everybody's awake now, right? Yes. Well, every uh, first Sunday, it's our uh, it's our tradition, it's our habit to go through the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed together, and we are going to do the Apostles' Creed. Uh, we're going to do the version found on, on page 851 in the hymnal. It'll be on the overhead, and I'll invite you to recite with me the Apostles' Creed. It's a if you're not familiar with it, it's a brief summary of the Christian faith, everything, you know, the, the basics and the essentials and non-negotiables of what we believe as Christians is all summarized here in this uh, great ecumenical creed. So recite with me the Apostles' Creed this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. One of the other things we normally do is we have an Old Testament, usually an Old Testament scripture reading, but on the first Sunday of the month, we usually read one of the two texts in the Old Testament that have the Ten Commandments uh, written there for us, and we're going to read Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. That'll be our reading, so if you have a Bible, if you want to turn to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to read the first 17 verses together. I'm going to read first 17 verses, and you can follow along. You don't have to recite them. But uh, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, give ear to the reading of the word of God. Moses writes, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments." You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's, since the reading of God's word. Well, from time to time, um, I find it helpful to, you know, we, we try to, when we have these readings, I try to make some brief comments on them, and with the Ten Commandments, there's a lot of things you can say, as you might have already heard this morning. We're going through the Ten Commandments in our study of the Heidelberg Catechism, and we're up to the Sixth, sixth Commandment, but there are some kind of overarching principles in how you deal with God's law, his moral law, uh, just as I said, the Apostles' Creed is a summary of the Christian faith, a brief summary of it. The Ten Commandments are a, su a brief summary of God's will for our lives as Christians. This is how God would have us live out of gratitude for what he's done for us in saving us through Christ by his, by his grace. And so uh, if you ever get a chance or if you, maybe you've read through the Shorter Catechism a few times, if you get to the section in the Shorter Catechism on the Ten Commandments, there's a specific question and it sounds odd to our ears, but it says, uh, what is the preface to the Ten Commandments? If you've read a novel or something or a book, a lot of times there's a foreword or a preface that kind of sets the stage for what comes to, to follow. Uh, and the preface is found in verses 1 and 2. It's the, the part 
before it goes into the actual Ten Commandments, one at a time. And this is what it says in verses 1 and 2. It says, And God spoke all these words, so that should get our attention. You know, very often God spoke through his prophets, and they were his mouthpiece. Well, in this particular case, the people heard God speak, and their knees were probably knocking, and it got their attention. But verse 2 is the preface. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. And God says that before he gets into no other gods before me, uh, the, the, no, no images, don't take my name in vain, remember the Sabbath day, all those commandments, before he gets to those, he reminds them of, of what he did to save them. And so it's very important for us to not get the order mixed up. And what I mean by that is very often we approach wrongly, approach God's law as, if I do this, uh, it, the, there's been a, a saying in, in political circles and news circles in the last year, quid pro quo, I don't know Latin, but maybe you've heard it enough in the news, and now you know a little phrase of Latin, it means this for that, I do this and God does that. Well, there's no quid pro quo when it comes to salvation. Uh, God does the saving first. He takes the initiative by his sovereign grace and mercy. And our part is the response to God's mercy. And that's, that's the, that is the biblical Christian view of the Ten Commandments. They are not given that we might work our way to salvation. God says, basically, if I can paraphrase, I've saved you, now live like this. Yeah. He, he doesn't say, I'm the Lord your God, or I will be the Lord your God if you do this. He doesn't say, I'll bring you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, if you do these ten things well enough. He says, by his grace, he is the Lord our God, by his grace in Christ, and he has delivered us from Egypt, from the house of slavery. He's delivered us through Christ, who was the real Passover, Paul says, from our sins. Our, our slavery, you know, we might think, well, I was never in Egypt. You know, I, was never, I was never a slave in Egypt. You were a worse kind of slave. We were all worse kinds of slaves than even them. As, as miserable as they were in their slavery, we were all outside of Christ, slave, slaves to sin, to the, to the condemnation of sin, to the corruption of sin, to the guilt of sin. And God saved us by sending his son to die in our place and rise for our justification. And because of that, now we get to live in a way that pleases God. And in a way that's pleasing to us as well. God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. It's not, it's not a burden to be strapped to your back. And so I hope that, you know, from if you haven't already, when you start reading God's laws and his word, if you're a believer in Christ, that you don't think of it as a burden. That you think of it as, here's how God would have me live in such a way as to express my gratitude for what he's done for me by his grace. That's, that's the, the right way to view his commandments if you are a believer in Christ this morning. Well, we do our, uh, we split up our pastoral prayer, so-called, into two parts. We follow the, uh, what's called the ACTS method. Uh, the, it's an acronym for adoration, the A, C, confession, T, thanksgiving, and S, a fancy word for asking for things, supplication. Uh, so we're going to go to the first part of that prayer, the prayer of adoration and confession. We praise God for his goodness, his mercies, and we confess our sins and receive his forgiveness. Let's, let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we thank you and praise you that by your mercy and grace in Christ uh, that you set your love upon us from before the foundation of the world and that because of that you sent your Son to die for our sins, to live the life that we have failed to live. You raised him for our justification. And we thank you that we get to call upon you, the one true and living God, as our God. And that by your grace and mercy and, and unbelievable kindness towards us, you are not ashamed to call us your people, and Christ our Lord is not ashamed to call us his brothers. And we praise you and thank you for that grace, Lord. We know that we don't begin to comprehend how great a privilege that is. And we'll only know in heaven for sure um, just how great a, a privilege it is to know you by your grace and be taken out of the kingdom of darkness and translated into your kingdom of marvelous light. Thank you that you have set your love upon us that we might proclaim your praises, not just every Sunday in this life, but through all eternity we'll spend our time marveling at your grace and power and majesty and praising you for it. Lord, we praise you for this day that you have made, that we can rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for the Lord's day. Thank you for blessing the Sabbath and making it holy for our benefit, that we might rest from our works, rest even from our recreations, and spend time worshiping you as practice for heaven, uh, 
that you even are pleased to work through your means of grace in the church. We praise you for that, Lord, that you, you sent your son to die for our sins and you sent your spirit into us to seal us for the day of redemption, to be the deposit or down payment for the inheritance that we might know for certain uh, that we have you as our father in Christ and that we have an inheritance uh, awaiting us in heaven that cannot be taken away, that rust cannot destroy, thieves cannot break in and steal, and moth does not destroy as well, Lord. Thank you for that. We praise you for that. We praise you for your kindness to us. And even these recent days, thank you for the rain that you send on the just and the unjust. Even yesterday uh, in this past weekend, thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we praise you for your goodness, for your power, for your majesty. We praise you that you make all things work together for our good to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And we praise you that no matter what we look at on the news, no matter what we see around us, we are not at the, the, uh, the mercy of chance or circumstance, but that you are sovereignly in control of all things. Lord Jesus, you are the head of all things for the sake of your church. You are even now gathering and defending your church from, from all her enemies and yours. And we praise you for that. We praise you that you are able to make even the worst things in this life work together for our good and for your glory. We praise you that one day uh, everyone will see uh, how you made all these things work together, that nothing happened by accident and nothing happened apart from your decree. Lord, we praise you that we serve a God that's, that's almighty and able to do all things and, and sovereign and able to, to make all things work together for our good. Lord, we, we confess that we have not always lived that way. Lord, we've not always lived in such a way, even after we've come to Christ, as if uh, to see your commandments as something other than a burden. Sometimes we treat it as a burden, Lord. Forgive us for that. Forgive us for not rejoicing so much in our salvation that we count living for you as nothing but a joy. Lord, forgive us for being anxious. Forgive us for, for not praying more, Lord. You tell us to be anxious for nothing but in all things by prayer and supplication to make our requests known to you and your peace that passes understanding. We'll guard our hearts and minds in Christ, Lord. Forgive us for being anxious and not being quick to pray. Lord, forgive us for praying and not expecting you to answer. Forgive us for sometimes thinking that we are better to our own children than you are to us. Lord, you say, you, if you being evil know how to good gifts, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, give good gifts to those who ask? Lord, we ask and we trust that you are more than willing to, answer, to hear and answer. Forgive us for the times we have not prayed as we should. Forgive us for not praying in faith. Lord, we ask that you'd have mercy on your church and our land for the many shortcomings and failures that we have been guilty of. We have not made you known the way that we should. We have uh, very often, your church has devolved into entertainment and other things rather than, than proclaiming your word and your gospel clearly and boldly by the power of your spirit. Lord, give us grace to be the salt and light you would have us to be. And forgive us for not being your witnesses that you call us to be. Lord, have mercy upon our land. We see all the unrest, all the violence and godlessness going on around us on all sides. And we ask that you would have mercy upon our land, that you would grant repentance and revival, grant repentance and faith to many, turn many from sin and unbelief to faith in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would have mercy upon our land, revive our land, revive your church in our land, and bring healing upon our land, Lord. Turn, turn many from wickedness, and sin and turn them back to you. Bring the fear of God back upon our land and heal our land. For we ask all these things in the name of Christ and for his glory. Amen. 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 For our next two hymns, you can remain uh, seated for. Next hymn is number 338, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
103 glorious things of thee are spoken. 403. Father, thank you for your great provision for us. Thank you that you have never left us begging bread, but you've given us our daily bread and so much more. Every good and perfect gift we, we have comes from you, the Father of lights, in whom there is no shadow of turning. Lord, thank you also for giving us the privilege of giving back a portion of what you have entrusted to us, that we might not only have our meet, needs met and the needs of our families met, but we also might be able to play some part in maintaining the ministry of your gospel here in our town. Take these gifts and offerings and use them as you see fit for the spread of your gospel in our town. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing the doxology together.
Bob is going to lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving and supplication. Rob couldn't make it today, so I'm in. Who is this new guy? Yes, things are getting back to civilization, and our barber is back in business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Makes one of us. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you all. Glad to have you. So glad to have you. Glad to have our friends from down in New Life visiting with us. Pleased with that always. And uh, uh, you know, during the week, always thinking of so many things. I'm sure you are too. Uh, and it's usually my habit to read a passage uh, before we go to the second part of our prayer, which is thanksgiving and supplication, but, um, and, and it's it's a rare thing for me to actually read something written by someone else other than just out of the scriptures, but um, we're, we're blessed to have so many Bibles in our homes, you probably do, I've got a bunch of Bibles, and I, I, a few weeks ago I opened up a Bible I hadn't looked at in a long time. Um, and shame on me, because in it was stuff, some real treasures, things that I don't even remember receiving, or reading, or whatever, years ago. And one of them is uh, a, a little article written by Arthur W. Pink. Now, I, I don't know if that rings a bell with any of you. Um, it would have probably 30 or 40 years ago. I know when I was, uh, the Lord first called me to himself when I was a young man, way back in the 70s, uh, those beautiful 70s. <laughs> um, uh, I think the first book outside of the scriptures itself and outside of the Westminster Standards uh, that I was exposed to and read was a book called The Attributes of God by Arthur W. Pink. And that was such a wonderful book. Uh, it's one of the books that burned up in my house when we burned down in the wildfires, so I've never replaced it, although it would be a wonderful book to replace. And it's an easy read, which is something that I need. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in it, uh, Arthur W. Pink quotes Stephen Charnock a lot, who is a, 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 a Puritan writer from way back. But Stephen Charnock's books, which I do have, um, on, uh, called The Attributes of God, or two volumes, and you know, Andy knows, two volumes about that thick and small print. And so those, I'm glad for Arthur W. Pink, because he, he kind of did the Reader's Digest version of all of that, but really opened my eyes to the sovereign God of sovereign grace that is presented in the Bible. Um, and uh, you may have, I may have along the way shared a little bit of his story, Arthur Pink, take too much time with that, but he was an interesting character. His life and my life almost overlapped. Uh, I was born in 55, <laughs> and he passed away in 53, and uh, uh, he, prior to be uh, the Lord calling him to the faith and calling him to Christ, was part of a cult, uh, it was called Theosophy. I don't know if you know it, not theonomy, that's another problem, <laughs> but, but theosophy, which is, a, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's, I hadn't, uh, I actually looked it up, and uh, it, it was, it's an, it, like a Gnostic type of inner, inner knowledge type of cult, uh, uh, founded by a woman, kind of like Mary Eddie Baker or something other cults but what and what he would do as a young man he would go to his cult meetings and but his father was a professing Christian and his father knew the scriptures and so every time he'd come home uh, from his meetings uh, his father would hit him with a verse and he'd just kind of pass on by hear the verse and go up to his room and, you know until the next morning well uh, one day God worked they got worked and called this man to himself, and his father gave him the verse that says, uh, there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Arthur Pink went up to his room, shut the door. He'd come out for three days. 
when he came out, he had been born again. And he was a prolific writer. Um, lately, we've had a message about uh, the fruit of the Spirit last week when we were uh, considering Pentecost Sunday, so-called. And uh, I had, so I pulled this out. It's called Missing God's Best. It's a little article he wrote. I'm not going to read the whole thing because I don't have the time right now. But it's called Missing God's Best. And it kind of plays upon what Pastor has already mentioned about God's law and obedience to him, how that we do it not to be saved, but we do it out of gratitude for God. And lo and behold, God gives grace upon grace when we do that, because God gives great blessing upon God's people when they're obedient. It's not that we're seeking something to get into God's good books, because how could you be in any better than to be in by the grace in Christ? Uh, so with, uh, but it brings to mind uh, the verse I love so much from 1 Samuel 2 that basically says, he that honoreth me, him will I honor. And so I thought I'd just read a little bit of this to you. And also, the first, one of the first things I was exposed to as a young man when I was first saved was uh, the Westminster Standards. Now, the, there's the shorter catechism and the larger catechism. One's shorter, one's larger. <laughs> and one's more intricate than the other, the larger one, because it's written for adults, whereas the shorter catechism is written for children. But I'll tell you what, the one written for children is already, uh, by today's standards of professing Christians and what they know about the Bible. But you know the, probably know the first question in the shorter catechism, which is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that's easy to remember. What about the larger catechism? It's the same question but there's a couple words added to it. And it says this, what is the chief and highest end of man? And the answer is, man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy him forever. That's interesting. I never noticed that till this morning <laughs> before I came that fully enjoy him forever. Now we of course know that because we're sinners and because we sin and, and we have to deal with ourselves and such that we'll never fully, fully, fully enjoy God in this present life. But that's the challenge. The challenge is to enjoy God's best here and now. And this is not the live your best life now, false gospel of prosperity. This is loving God, obeying God, and Lo and behold, grace upon grace, he blesses you for it, causes you to grow, and gives you great joy, and gives, his, his, gives you his best for the here and now, this side of glory, as sinners. And so that's what this little article is called, Missing God's Best. Because many professing Christians, me included, oftentimes we miss God's best because we're either willfully disobedient or we're just going around in a daze and don't really appreciate the Lord. We don't appreciate his church. We don't, and I think this last pandemic situation has really uh, enlivened and enlightened my appreciation for the church because we couldn't do what we're doing right now. And that, believe it or not, has never happened in the history of this country until now, for whatever reason. Uh, even war, even civil war, even revolutionary war the gathered church still could gather but not lately so uh, I, I'm, this is the reader's digest version of this because I don't have uh, the time to read it all but I hope it, it, it encourages you I hope it makes you desire to show the Lord more love and uh, obedience because obedience is a good word it's not a bad word but uh, 
He, he, in this article, he uses 2 Chronicles 16.9, which says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. He goes on to say, none of us have perfect heart. It means mature heart. It means a heart that trusts in him. It means that you've been born again. And he says uh, here that the Lord runs to and fro. The Lord is very active throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on your behalf. But he goes on to say in Psalm 81, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Sounds like uh, Exodus 20. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up into their own hearts lusts, and they walked in their own counsels. And he goes on to say that the church, he be, this is interesting because he lived in the, uh, and ministered in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Um, he bemoaned the state of the visible church then, that people were losing interest in the gathered church. Professing Christians were becoming more like the world than they were like Christ. And I mean, if we compared then to now, uh, he, I mean, he'd roll over in his grave, I think. Uh, well, anyway, um, I'll move on. <laughs> Basically, the premise is you put God, for, God first, second, uh, people, other people second, and self last, you will be blessed beyond measure. You don't necessarily do it consciously or do it for the blessing, but God gives grace upon grace. And, and he says, oh, that thou hadst hearken to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. He says, and then he goes on to say, do you know that God requires much more of you and me today than he did 10 years ago? What does that mean? It means as we live the Christian life, the older we get, more is expected of us of the Lord. Instead of the opposite, we tend to go the other way. Well, I do. The other way, the way of spiritual laziness and what have you. But, but here he says, you know, God requires much more from us today than he did 10 years ago. And from those who enjoy an edifying ministry than those who do not. Ask yourself this morning. Do you enjoy an edifying ministry? I do, right here, right here. Right here where the word of God is upheld with no apology. It's upheld in the fullness of truth, the sovereignty of God, even though the majority of the visible church of our day does not promote it. Uh, so God expects us to be so thankful and rejoice and that's how we get God's best. It is a blessed thing, an unspeakable privilege, he says, to be favored with light from God, the word, especially in a day when darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness to people, Isaiah 60, verse 2, which has been the case of Christendom these last few decades. But <laughs> that was then. Think about now. Does it seem to you like darkness is covering the earth right now? It sure does to me, <laughs> in a very new way in our own land. Uh, and, and he says, one of the ways to not enjoy God's best is, as it says in Haggai, that many of the visible church of his day, because they neglected the house of God and put their own affairs over that, that they missed the blessing. And so I, I'm gonna just leave it at that. There was, there was so much more I thought I'd read, but I'll be here all day and you won't like me. So uh, it's, I was encouraged by this, very much so. Not to feel any, and he, he, the first part of his little article here, he lays it out that this, he's not promoting legalism in any way, shape or form. This is just the way of blessing. The way of blessing is to put God first. You did that this morning because you got up and you came here. No matter how you feel in your body, you may not feel all that great. Maybe you have aches and pains, but you came here. Uh, maybe something's tr really troubling you in your heart, uh, 
in your life out there. But you didn't let that keep you from here. You came here. You came here because you put God first. And you will not walk away from here without a blessing. That's a promise. And I can remember, uh, real quick, the old days when I had such a rigorous schedule. Like uh, Tuesday nights we went out door to door in evangelism. Wednesday nights we had a prayer meeting and a Bible study. Friday nights we had a married couples group. Sunday mornings we had uh, Sunday school and worship. Sunday afternoons we went out and preached in Balboa Park. Sunday nights we had another. And I can remember confessedly going, oh, I gotta go again. Like on a Tuesday night after you've worked all day and you're gonna go knock on doors and have them slammed in your face in many cases and you're like, but there was never a time that I went, no matter how I felt when I went, that I wasn't blessed. I, wasn't bl I was blessed by having fellowship with another man in the faith because we'd go out in pairs. If nothing else, I had that blessing. And that is uh, money can't buy. So anyway, we'll go to our, uh, we have so much to be thankful. I think maybe that's the bottom line point. We're going to the prayer of thanksgiving and we sure are. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you so much for the beautiful sunshine, the coolness of the air, the beauties around us, our beautiful community that you have blessed us with. We thank you so much for that. We thank you, Lord, most of all, of what day this is, the Lord's Day. We thank you, Lord, that this is the best day of the week for our souls. We thank you so much for that. We thank you that uh, you have put it in our minds and in our hearts to be here, to be under your word, to give you honor and praise and glory out of gratitude for you for saving our souls, uh, or, or writing our names in your uh, everlasting book, of dying, Lord Jesus, on our behalf as we're going to celebrate and proclaim once again as we have the Lord's Supper this morning. Lord, and, and for coming to us, Holy Spirit, and drawing us to Christ. Lord, how we thank you. And because of that, you have changed our hearts towards you. We no longer have hearts of stone, but we have hearts of flesh, as your word says. You have given us spiritual hearts. You have taken the scales off of our eyes that we might see your truth. You have unstopped our ears that we might hear your truth and understand it. And Lord, what a blessing it is to have this light, the light of your scriptures, guiding our lives day by day in a world that seems to be increasingly dark. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for bringing us here. We thank you that Mona's here with us this morning. We thank you that everyone that is here is here, no matter what they may be feeling right now in their bodies. You have raised them up sufficiently to be here. We pray for any who sit here this morning that aren't feeling that well or have some pain of body that you would relieve them, you would raise them up above the, the distraction of it, that they might be fully blessed by the word. We just thank you, Lord, for changing our hearts, changing our affections, for making us new creatures in Christ Jesus. Lord, uh, we know we are sinners. We know we sin. And Lord, how we, we hold those up to you and thank you that you tell us that if we confess them to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us of them and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a promise that we lay hold of day by day by day. And we thank you. We thank you for this gathered church. We thank you, Lord, that we still have the freedom to gather here. We thank you that in spite of what has happened in these past months, that you have a, a allowed us to be back together in this way to worship together and to enjoy the communion of the saints, to enjoy each other's fellowship, to enjoy being lifted up and supported and encouraged by fellow believers. As iron sharpens iron, you tell us that so we sharpen each other's countenance. Lord, thank you. We have so much to thank you for. We thank you for our health and our strength. We thank you for our employments that we might support our families and support your church. We thank you, Lord, for our freedoms. We thank you, Lord, for everything. For all things come from you. You're the giver of every good and perfect gift. 
And Lord, how we ask. We, we are so blessed, and yet we come before you and ask. We ask, Lord, uh, for you to pour out your Holy Spirit upon our land. We live in a land of great turmoil, of great words can't express it. Many are so filled with animosity and hate. And, and Lord, we just marvel at how unrestrained men and women behave themselves. As your word has been swept under the carpet over these past decades, more and more and more, we see lawlessness more and more and more. We see unrestraint more. And Lord, how we pray that you would turn the tide. We don't, we don't doubt that you can do so. We just doubt that you will do so. And shame on us. As men prayed this morning before we began our church service, we, we prayed, Lord, that you'd help us to pray big and not small. We're prone to ask small things because of our own innate unbelief. Lord, we ask for big things. Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to trust in you that you will make all things right. We know you will in the last day. We know that all things will be made right and we are ushered into glory. But Lord, we pray that you would make things right in the here and now. You would glorify yourself and honor your sovereignty by uh, thwarting the purposes of evil in our land. It appears to us more and more that we wrestle not simply against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in high places. We wrestle against the, the uh, wiles of the devil who would seek to rub out your church and to rub out all that which is good in our land. We pray against that. Oh Lord, we thank you that you are the sovereign God of sovereign grace. And if you weren't so, we wouldn't have been saved in the first place because it is not of him that willeth or him that runneth, but God that shows mercy. And we thank you, Lord, that you did that in, in the case of many of us here who profess your name. You took us out of the kingdom of darkness and you translated us into the kingdom of your dear son. How we thank you. Lord, we thank you for everything you've given us. It's all gifts. All the graces you give us. The preaching of the word, the singing of it, the uh, reading of it, the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and of baptism and of prayer itself. And you instructed us how to pray when you instructed your disciples to pray thus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power Glory Our sermon text this morning is Psalm 122. I had that psalm stuck in my head since last Sunday. We used it as our call to worship. And uh, so I thought as we often go through a psalm on these first Sundays of the month, that it would be a good one for us to go through. So if you have a Bible, if you want to stand, if you're able to, to do so, I'll invite you to stand and uh, follow along as I read our sermon text, Psalm 122. I'm reading from the ESV translation. It says, a song uh, of ascents of David. And David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, uh, as was declared for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Uh, their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. 
Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This end is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Well, let's, uh, let's pray and ask God to teach us his word this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that, as always, you give it to us as a light to our feet, a lamp to our path, that by it you reveal to us the way of salvation through faith in Christ, and you show us how you would have us to live. You have given us all things that we need for life and godliness through your word, and we ask once again that you'd work in us by your Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear great things from your word, for we ask all of these things in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, Psalm 122 uh, begins with David's exclamation of gladness that I think some of us can probably sympathize with in recent days when his brothers in the, in the faith encouraged him, saying to him, uh, he says, they told him, let us go to the house of the Lord, exclamation point. Maybe not having been able to go the last few months, I don't know about you, uh, but uh, I will probably never look at this verse in the same way again after these last few months, after churches all around our country uh, even our own, were prohibited from gathering together in, for public worship by our state and local governments in response to this coronavirus pandemic. You know, when we were finally allowed to get together in person last Sunday, I was one happy camper. You know, it's not the same thing staring at a screen and, you know, all I can think of is I'm old enough to remember Mr. Rogers, maybe some of you do too, and he used to, once in a while, he would hold this little circle thing up and he'd pretend he would see the people watching and he'd say your names and I would always be like, is he going to say Andy? And he almost never did. You know, he doesn't see me. <laughs> it's kind of how I felt. Like, I was like, I see so-and-so. And I didn't see so-and-so. But I'm glad that we're all back uh, together, even if we're a little bit more spread out than, than normal. And uh, we're, we are glad that we have the technology to do these things and, and stream the service so those who can't be here for various reasons could still participate and be doing so at home. Well, in, in this psalm, uh, David talks about his gladness at public worship at gathering with his, his comrades in the faith. Uh, and in the psalm, what David does is he extols uh, the beauty and virtues of Jerusalem, which may seem kind of a foreign thing to us in the middle of the psalm in verses 3 through 5. He extols Jerusalem as the place in his day where the Lord had decreed for his people to gather for corporate worship. That took place at the tabernacle or the temple in verses 3 through 4. It's also a place Jerusalem was where righteous judgments were to be found, that's something I think when we look at the news these days, uh, we wish we could have some more of, of that kind of thing, that God's justice and judgment would be made known. And he's telling us here in this psalm, he's telling us in the rest of the psalm after verses 1 and 2, why he was so glad when he was told, let's go up to the house of the Lord. He gives us briefly a, a number of reasons why that is, that he was so happy to join his fellows at God's house. And then in verses 6 through 9, David exhorts the faithful. Remember, it starts off, his fellows exhorted him, saying, let's go to the house of the Lord. In the last few verses of the psalm, David exhorts the rest of us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem in verse 6. In fact, he mentions peace three times in verses 6 through 8. It seems to be the theme of the last part of the verse. Uh, peace and prosperity of Jerusalem, of the place of God's people and God's worship in his day. And, and all those who love her, uh, peace and prosperity being upon them are the repeated refrain and concern in the last part of the psalm. You might even know, you know, the psalm mentions peace three times, and the name Jerusalem, you might already know what it means. What's the last part of that name? Shalom, peace. So peace among God's people is kind of the central focus of the whole psalm, and where else do you get to have a, a, a chance to, to have peace in the midst of confusion and chaos, if not in public worship of God in his house. Well, maybe you read a psalm like this, maybe you read a lot of the psalms, and you say, I don't know how this applies to me. This was written about a city that we don't live in, a city that's not the same as it was in David's day. The temple is no longer even there. It's been torn down and been gone from the, from the earth since A.D. 70. And so you might say to yourself, you know, how does this apply to us in the church today? We are not citizens, obviously, of the earthly Jerusalem, uh, nor is the public worship of God any more confined to one location as it was in David's day, for the most part, at the tabernacle or temple. In John chapter 4, remember the woman 
tells Jesus, you know, you Jews worship where you are, and we worship where we are, I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus said, there's coming a day when God will seek worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. In other words, not in a, sp a certain location only, but spiritually and in the truth, and that is the case even now. William Plummer, a uh, great commentator on the book of Psalms, rightly notes this. He says, it will weaken the force of this psalm if we forget that Jerusalem was a type of the true church of Christ and also of the heavenly state. In other words, in a lot of the psalms and elsewhere in the scriptures, when you read of Jerusalem, one of the things it should remind you of, and it serves as a type or a pattern of, is the true church of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the church. We often say that Israel in the Old Testament was the Old Testament church, just as we are in the New Testament, the New Testament church of Christ. And so Jerusalem was a type of the church. That means it's a type of us as the gathered church. And it's also a type of heaven. It's a picture in small scale, uh, an analogy of heaven. And so everything that David says of the earthly Jerusalem in his day in this psalm, everything he says about the house of God in his day in this psalm, really, if you think about it, it's as timely and relevant as it's ever been. Because ultimately, it speaks both of the church and the public worship of the church on the Lord's day in this life, as well as it speaks of the new Jerusalem, which we looked at at the end of the book of Revelation a number of months ago. Which in some sense, remember that picture of Revelation 21, we're going to read a little bit, a little bit of it later in the sermon, that picture of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Uh, and, and what is it? It's a place, but it's a people. It's kind of a mixed metaphor of sorts. It's, it's not just the, the place, but it's a people of God, the place where God dwells with his people. So we should be as glad at the thought of going to public worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ at the house of the Lord on the Lord's day as David was in his day to go to the tabernacle or the temple. Maybe even more so. We have in some ways greater privileges than even David had in his day. We have the entirety of scripture given to us already. We have the full picture revealed to us in Christ of which they looked at in shadows and types in the Old Testament. And you and I should love, I think this psalm teaches us, that you and I should love the church and diligently seek after her purity and peace and prosperity in all of our prayers and all the things that we do. And we should look forward also to that day, I think this psalm is telling us, when the church, which is the bride of Christ, is revealed in all of her glory in heaven, when our fellowship with and worship of the Lord together will be unbroken, perfect, and perpetual forever. You know, our, our worship, our fellowship in this life is imperfect at best. It's still good. It's still God-honoring. It's still God's will that we have these things in this life. But in heaven, it will all be perfect. All the things that prevent us from worshiping God with all of our hearts uh, will be strip, stripped away. We won't have the problems that we have with worship once we're in heaven with the Lord on that last day. Well, I'd like with that in mind to look at a few brief exhortations from the psalm to all of us from this psalm of David. And the first lesson I think of this psalm is that we should look forward to public worship with God's people in God's house on the Lord's day. We should look forward to public worship with God's people every Lord's day. That was certainly David's attitude that he models for us here in this psalm. This psalm is written for our benefit. You know, David could have been glad when his companion said to him, you know, let's go to the house of the Lord and not written a single word about it. But David wrote this not just for his own benefit and edification, but for yours and mine as well. And so when David says in verses 1 and 2, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. He's writing that for us. And you get the impression from these verses that you didn't have to tell David twice. His friends didn't have to nag him to come to church. They told him once and he was, he was ready to go. He couldn't wait to get to the house of God fast enough. He was glad to hear the exhortation of his fellow Israelites when they invited him to accompany them to worship in God's house. In fact, the words in verse 2, they might seem strange to us. In fact, they're translated in different, slightly different ways. If you look at a King James or New American Standard, it's hard to tell sometimes with Hebrew, uh, Hebrew writing in the Old Testament if something is past tense or future. Um, some translated as our feet are going to be standing, they shall stand. Like We're not there yet, but we're going to be. This one 
the ESV puts it as past. Our feet have been standing within your gates. When he says that, it seems to paint a picture uh, of him and his brothers anxiously waiting at the door of the house of God. They're in Jerusalem. They're ready to go. They're waiting for the door to open. That, that's how much they look forward to worship. They're there with bells on. You know, I, I, I can't help but think of, not that I would compare worship of God to entertainment, but you, know, you think of like going to Disneyland or, or to a ball game or something. Sometimes you get there so early, the doors aren't even open, and you're standing there not knowing what to do with yourself, and you're kind of looking at your watch, and you, come on, is this door going to open? That's how we should be when it comes to worship on the Lord's Day in God's house. Well, so I, I asked this morning not to give anybody a guilt trip, but what about you? What about me? Do you count the Lord's Day Sunday as the best day of the week? Is there another day that you count better than Sunday? I hope that's not the case. I remember, uh, I, I hope that you don't make a habit of reading books by Joel Osteen. One was sort of subtly referenced uh, by Rob. He does not read them either. But he had a book, uh, Your Best Life Now, which I don't recommend. But he also had another book, and I, I did not read it, but the very title alone offended me. And it was every day of Friday. Like, you're supposed to be a Christian minister, and you want people to be, thank, thank God it's Sunday. Friday's not the best day of the week. Sunday is. We get to start our week. It feels like the end of the week is of the weekend, but we get to start our week with fellowship and worship of the Lord. Do you look at Sunday as the best day of the week? Do you look forward to public worship with your, with your family in Christ every Lord's Day in, in God's house? And one of the ways you can tell this is, what does it take to keep you away? In, in, the, in my old days, it didn't take very much at all to keep me away. Maybe that was the case for you as well. Frankly, many of the outward things that most commonly keep people away from the Lord's house on Sundays have been kind of stripped away by the recent events in our nation over the past few months. Many of those things involve various forms of entertainment or amusement, things such as sporting events, movies, dining out, among other things. The various distractions that we have uh, from worship, a lot of them have been taken away. Not that we don't find other things to distract us from worship, but I think that in, in some sense, if you want to look for a silver lining, uh, not that people still aren't breaking the Sabbath and the fourth commandment, but uh, it's, it's harder to do so, at least outwardly. There's no games to go to and whatnot. Sadly, for many professing Christians in our day, it doesn't seem to take very much at all to keep them from worshiping God with God's people on his day. And that's really nothing new, is it? You know, you often hear me say things like, in our day, as if things have really changed that much. And in a lot of ways, they haven't. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, tells us, in the last 2,000 years, not a lot has really changed because we, as people, really haven't changed. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, and let us consider how to stir one another, or stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, we, we like to talk about the good old days, and there have been good old days, but the first century church, the writer of Hebrews was already saying, as is the habit of some. Some were already neglecting the public worship of God and the fellowship of believers in his day. Now, the reason for that is probably quite different in their case as it is in our case, in our land at least. In his day, it was persecution. Naming the name of Christ, being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, worshiping the Lord with God's people, put a target on your back. And many, especially converted Jews, didn't want any part of that. And so they kind of, in a sense, the temptation was to kind of go back to the temple worship, to kind of be an undercover Christian. And the writer of Hebrews tells him, you can't do that. You can't go back. You can't go back to the types and shadows. And so the writer of Hebrews tells them, stir one another up to love and good works. And one of the ways you fail to do that, you can't do that, is if you're neglecting to gather together with God's people. That's, the, that's where it starts. If we don't gather, there's no stirring up of one another to love and good works. There's no encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near if we don't gather. So way back in the first century AD, it was the habit of some to neglect. It was their habit. It was their settled practice or tendency to neglect the gathering of God's people for worship. And the Bible 
tells us that should not be the case. Brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be the case. Now, there are legitimate reasons for some to miss and, and to neglect, so to speak, the gathering. You know, there are many that physically are unable to gather. That's why we're still having the streaming that we have. There are those who, by illness or infirmity, are incapable or unable to meet. That is not what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. To neglect implies that you're able to do something and just don't. So those who cannot be here for various reasons should not take a, you know, discouragement from Hebrews 10. They want to be here. You know, you can tell what kind of person, what kind of believer you are is, you know, when you miss church, do you miss it? Well, there are those who neglect it that don't miss it when they miss it. If you're missing church when you actually miss it, that, 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 that would tell you this isn't really talking about you. This is talking about some other kind of neglect of God's worship. Do you recall Luke's amazing description of the early church in Acts chapter 2? We read it last Sunday for Pentecost Sunday. Uh, chapter 2 is one of those amazing chapters when you read about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church in Jerusalem. Uh, and what was the result? Do you remember towards the end of the chapter? What was the result? What happened as a result of God pouring out his spirit on his church there on that first Pentecost, the day of Pentecost? Acts 2.42 tells us the result of that outpouring of the Spirit. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, the, the they there, that's bad grammar, but the they that he's talking about is these 3,000 souls that were added to the church in one day. Peter preached the sermon on Pentecost Sunday, and 3,000 Jews from all over the world had gathered for the feast of Pentecost, heard the word of the gospel of Christ, and were marvelously, miraculously converted to Christ. And what's the first thing they did? What's the first thing Luke tells us? You know, we have, we have a, a, an odd view of evangelism in our day. We have, not condemning them, they're, they're fine things in and of themselves, but we have these great evangelistic crusades. And thousands of people sometimes, and we hope that they're sincere, you know, go down the aisles and, and accept Christ. And sometimes you get the feeling like you accept Christ and that's it. You've got your, insurance, your fire insurance policy in your back pocket. You go right back to living the way you did. Not in Acts 2. Acts 2, they didn't get their fire insurance policy and go back to their old ways of life. They committed themselves to each other. Read it again, Acts 2.42. They knew Christians. You almost get the claim nobody even had to tell them to do this. The Spirit of God just led them to it. They devoted themselves to these things. They didn't just kind of add this as a little side thing to their life. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, teaching of the word of God. The fellowship, they weren't Lone Ranger Christians, they were with each other. The fellowship, the breaking of bread, that's the Lord's Supper, and the prayers. It doesn't say, and to prayer, which of course is probably true as well. The prayers implies corporate prayer with God's people. They prayed together, they fellowshiped together, they had the Lord's table together, they heard the teaching of the apostles together, and that was the work of the filling of the Holy Spirit among them. It's because the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church and upon these people that they devoted themselves to those things. And those things that I just read, fellowship, the teaching of the apostles, the breaking of the bread and prayers, what is that, what is that describing? Well, we in Presbyterian circles called the outward and ordinary means of grace. And that's a, that's a fancy schmancy way of saying how God works. These are the things God uses to build us up in the faith and make us grow in his grace. And they were devoted to those things. And so it shouldn't be a shock to any of us to read the rest of Acts 2 and see the church kept growing. And not just in number, but in godliness and concern for one another. They, their lives were transformed by, the, by God's means of grace that they were devoted to by his grace and it says in verse 47 the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved lives were changed sinners were saved not by some program not by some spectacular anything but by the grace of God in the means of grace in the church simple things like the preaching of the word of God the fellowship of believers these are the things we should be devoted to as well we should likewise uh, yearn and pray that we might be too filled with the Holy Spirit and be devoted because of that to the means of grace in public worship. 
that were to happen among us, we would more and more see the Lord Jesus at work among us, saving sinners and transforming and changing lives. That's what changes things. You know, if, that, if that were the case, if we were to, to do that and by God's grace, see God at work among us that way, changing lives, saving sinners, I don't think a pack of wild horses could keep us from church. We'd, we'd be excited. We'd be glad when they said to us, hey, it's Sunday. Let's go to the house of the Lord. Well, the second, the second exhortation from our psalm this morning that I would like to offer to you is not only should we look forward to worship on the Lord's day in his house, but we should also learn to have a great love for the church, a great love for the church as well. That, that goes hand in hand with the, for, with the former thing. A love for public worship implies it necessitates a love for Christ's church. David, in verses 3 through 5, he kind of extols for us the, the, the greatness, the glories of, of the earthly Jerusalem, but with an eye to the heavenly one, I believe. In verses 1 and 2, he tells us, he exclaims how glad he was about going to church, so to speak. And in verses 3 through 5, he writes, Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, it was on a hill, Tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, you know, the 12 tribes, the people of Israel, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. What was it about Jerusalem that made David so prone to extol its, its, its greatness, its majesty in this psalm? What, when David went up the hill to Jerusalem, why did he get so excited? What was he so thrilled about and praised God for? What was it about the city in particular? He doesn't. There are psalms where David uh, talks about different structures of the city, the towers, the walls, and the, the defenses and those kind of things. It isn't like he ignored those, but what does he talk about in the psalm? He doesn't really talk about those things hardly at all. What he talks about is worship. When he talks about the tribes, the 12 tribes, the tribes of the Lord going up, he's talking about the people of God gathering. And he's talking about worship when he says, you know, why did they go up? Why, what is the reason he gives in the psalm why the tribes of the Lord went up to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem? Verse 4, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. That's what, he's talking about worship. That's what made Jerusalem... Jerusalem, that's what made Jerusalem special and set it apart in David's day. And notice, notice the way he describes worship there. Now there's a lot of other things you could talk about when you talked about the worship in the tabernacle or the temple. He could have talked about the sacrifices. He certainly could have done that. He could have talked about any number of things, but he talked about giving thanks. Thankfulness is to be a hallmark of Christian worship. We have a lot to be thankful for to our God and our Savior, especially even during times of affliction, even during times of difficulty and trial. We have much to be thankful for. When the Bible says be thankful in all things, God, God doesn't play games. He doesn't require of us things that we don't have actual reason for. It's because we have reason, abundant reason, to be thankful in all things, no matter what our circumstances may be. We've been blessed, Paul says in Ephesians 1, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We have every spiritual blessing if you're in Christ. You may not feel like you do, but you do have every blessing in Christ. We have Christ in you, Paul says, which is the hope of glory, Colossians 1, 27. You have the Holy Spirit within you, sealing you for the day of redemption as a down payment for your salvation in heaven one day that makes that makes us know we have it these are all blessings we should rejoice and give thanks for we, we rejoice we give thanks because we serve the lord jesus christ who even now lives and reigns at the right hand of god we serve a, a living savior who reigns at god's right hand revelation 1 5 you know the first part of the book of revelation kind of sets the tone for the rest of the book revelation 1 5 it calls jesus the ruler of kings on earth also calls him in that book the, the king of kings and lord of lords. That's not some future distant thing. John is telling us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus rules over the kings on earth now. 
They answer to him now. He judges those who go against him in his time, in this life, and defends his church. He also talks about in the psalm, in verse 5, he talks about their thrones for judgment are set. You know, if there's one thing in recent days that maybe it's, it's grieved you as it's grieved me and many others, it's the lack of justice, the lack of just judgment. We see un, unjust things being done left and right and center. Well, when he thought of the thrones in Jerusalem, he thought of God's just judgments. God's righteous judgment being carried out in all things. That's why he made him rejoice. So thrones for judgment were set there. And I, so I asked this morning, do you love the church? Not just do you look forward to worship, but do you love the church? Despite all of her weaknesses and imperfections in this life, do you love and cherish that which is called the bride of Christ? You know, there, there's an old sort of joke, you know, uh, you know, if you find the perfect church, stay away because you'll mess it up. You know, there is there is no perfect church. If you find it, don't yeah, don't rock the boat. Uh, but there is no there is no perfect church in this life. Not this one. Not anyone. If anybody tells you different, you probably need to leave that place. There is no perfect church in this life. But the church of Christ is not to be neglected. We should love it despite all of her imperfections and weaknesses in this life. The church of God, Paul tells Timothy, is the household of God, the family of God which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. The most humble, true church of God is the church of the living God. It doesn't get any more important or better than that. Not only that, but Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He purchased his church with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. There is a desperate need in our day, I think, uh, for what I would call, and some have called it past days, Good churchmen, you know, in, in decades and centuries past, that was that was kind of almost a, a definition of a Christian man. Was a, was he was a good churchman? The church wasn't at the periphery of his of their life. The church was in the center in a lot of ways. You you don't have to be as busy in the church as what Rob described every single day of the week. Something going on. I wouldn't want to wear anybody out that much. Uh, but the church should be something in the center of your life. Because it's where God is at work, saving sinners and sanctifying his saints. And what, is, what does David say in verse 6? He says, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And even says there, um, I'm going to read the King James way of putting part of verse 6 there. It says, they shall prosper that love thee. Kind of sounds like that Arthur Pink thing. And God, God blesses and rewards obedience. He doesn't save you by your obedience, but he very often blesses our far from perfect obedience. And those who love his church, what does he say? They shall prosper that love thee. He prayed for the peace and prosperity of the church, and David prayed for the peace and prosperity of those who love the church in his day. Notice three times he prays for peace in our psalm in verses 6 through 8. He prayed for the peace of God's people, both for the city of God as well as those within her walls. He says, verse 8, for my brothers and companions' sake. He didn't just pray for, it wasn't just the place, it was the people in the place, the people of God. And so I'll ask this morning, I'm asking a lot of questions of you to apply to yourself, but do you pray for the church? <laughs> Not just this church, pray for the church everywhere. Do you pray for the persecuted church in places like Nigeria and China and North Korea and Iran, places like that? Do you pray for the church? Do you pray for her peace and prosperity the way that David does for Jerusalem here in our text? And when we say prosperity, that's a loaded word, right? We don't mean just earthly, material prosperity. That's, that's what the worldly people would, would look at and, and seek after. But true prosperity, spiritual prosperity, isn't, isn't always anything about material at all. You could be the, the poorest, most run-down, beat-up church in the middle of the plains somewhere with nothing, you know, nothing to its name, but they have the Lord. They are rich in, in the Lord. That's what we should be praying for. Two Sundays ago, I, we sang a hymn called, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. I was very tempted to have us sing it again today. I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. The hymn writer, Timothy Dwight, I think, I'm not saying he based his hymn on this psalm, but he must have known something of the heartbeat of David towards the Old Testament church when he wrote that hymn, and we sang this 
A couple Sundays ago, verses 2 to 3 says this. I won't sing it. It says, I love thy church, O God. Her walls before thee stand. Dear as the apple of thine eye engraven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall. For her my prayers ascend. To her my cares and toils be given till toils and cares shall end. God's kingdom and the church are so much overlapped in this life that uh, Timothy Dwight, just like King David, saw it and wrote about it and had us sing about it. In the words of Hebrews 12, 14, a familiar verse, he says, We are to strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's a picture of the peace and prosperity of, of the church. You might remember if you were here last Sunday, our son Benjamin became a communicant member of our church, which was a happy and proud day for us as a family as well as for our church and for Ben. Uh, and when he came up front here, he took membership vows, five membership vows from the Book of Church Order. And if you're a member of this church, you may it may have been a long time ago, but you took these same vows that Ben took uh, up front. And the fifth one of those goes as follows, the last one of those five membership vows. It says, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the church? And then it says, and promise to study its purity and peace. Now, that's a strange way of phrasing something. We don't really talk that way commonly these days. But what does it mean to study its purity and peace? It means to make every effort toward it, to think about it, to make it your priority, to make it your goal, to make it something that uh, guides and, and sometimes restricts your behavior and words and things that we do in the church. That we ask ourselves, is this going, if I do or say this, is this going to promote peace and purity in the church or division and schisms and ungodliness? That's what, we, that's what we vow to do when we join the church, to pray for the peace and purity and study for the peace and purity of the church. That's, you know, we should do, make every effort, every sincere effort in all things to do whatever we can to be of benefit to those in the church, the spiritual well-being and prosperity of our brothers and sisters. To use the words of the hymn I just quoted, that means our tears, prayers, cares, and toils go towards the peace and purity of God's church. Now, if we have truly known the love of Jesus Christ, one of the evidences of that love, one of the results of that love, will be a love for God's people in the church. 1 John 3, 14 to 15, the Apostle John says this, we know that we have passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Love for the brethren, love for your brothers and sisters in Christ in the church is one of the chief evidences of, of God's saving grace in a person's life. And how can someone truly say they love their brothers if they avoid church like the plague? It's a bad sign. Not talking about those who can't make it or when something comes up now and again. If we, you know, if we're the opposite of what David says in verse 1. You know, David gets invited to church, so to speak, and he says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. If our attitude is, eh, you know, uh, let me check my calendar. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bad sign that we don't love the brethren. If we don't love the brethren, how do we know we even love and know Christ? If we know Christ's love, we will love those who are his body, our brothers in Christ. Well, one last lesson for us, I think, is implied in this psalm, and that's we must learn to cultivate a longing for heaven. We should look forward to worship, we should love the church, and we should cultivate a longing for heaven. I think that's one of the aims and results of spirit-filled worship in the church. Public worship, we often say, in some small way, it's kind of like practice for heaven. Not just choir practice, but practice for heaven. It may not always feel like it, but it, it, it's to be a foretaste in some small way of heaven, of that new Jerusalem that we read about in Revelation 21. You know, think about the Lord's Supper that we're going to partake of here shortly. Now, if we're honest... You know, when I uncover these trays and you see the little pieces of bread and little teeny weeny cups of, of grape juice and wine, um, 
Does it look in any way outwardly impressive? I know it's a nice shiny tray and has a little cross on the top, but there's nothing impressive about it at all. If, if your unsaved friends that didn't know the Bible from the phone book, if they came with you to church someday and we had the Lord's Supper, they would not be sitting there with their jaws gaping open. Wow, look at that little piece of bread in the cup. I get to have that all on my, you know. No, are you going to finish all that? You know, nobody looks a little cup of wine, right, and says, wow, I don't know if I can, you know, it, it's not impressive. There's nothing outwardly about it. In fact, to an unbeliever who doesn't know anything about the scriptures or the Lord's Supper, it probably looks kind of silly. Like, you guys make a big deal. Your pastor makes these big warnings about eating a piece of bread the size of my thumbnail. Why would God judge me for eating a piece of bread if I don't know the Lord? Like, but there's more than meets the eye here. It's not outwardly impressive in any way. But to the eye of faith, what are you doing when you partake of this simple piece of bread and that cup of wine or juice? You're partaking by faith and by the work of the Spirit. You're partaking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Not physically, not corporally, as the, the, the standards say, but you're by faith and by the work of the Spirit partaking of Christ's body and blood, being nourished to your growth in grace. And not only that, this is, where we, this is why we call it communion, you're communing with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven and with all the saints with him. Even the public worship of the gathered church as unimpressive as it often looks. You know, I think that's one of the problems in the church today is we try as hard as we can, too hard. You know people that try too hard? We try too hard to make it look impressive. And what are people impressed by? Rock concerts and TED Talks? I don't know, but that's what we try to do. We try to make it look, jazz it up and make it look impressive. It's, not, it's never going to look impressive in this life, but one day in heaven, it's going to look impressive. You and I will be in awe in heaven one day when we're with the Lord in heaven in, in, in the new Jerusalem, the one that comes down from heaven and the new heavens and the new earth. Public worship in the church is a foretaste of heaven to the one with the eye of faith. We need to cultivate that eye of faith. We need to cultivate a longing for heaven. We need to say, I get to have this meal, this covenant meal with the Lord and with God's people, but one day it's going to be the, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we're going to see for what it really is and be with the Lord in heaven on that day. We must understand also that David, you know, when he writes the Psalms, very often I think we're tempted to think, well, David didn't really know anything. He just saw the outward things and wrote about those. David was a prophet, Acts 2.30. The Apostle Peter mentions David was a prophet and knew a lot more than you think he knew. He was not blind to the reality of the earthly Jerusalem. Even in all of its glory in his day was a type and shadow of the heavenly Jerusalem which was to come. The very end of our Bibles, uh, almost the very last chapter of our Bible, Revelation 21, talks about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4, it says this. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And here it is. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. When David talks about the glories of Jerusalem in Psalm 122 and how he couldn't wait to get there, that's what he was looking to. It wasn't the buildings, it wasn't the temple. All those pointed forward to Christ and all those things pointed forward to that. Revelation 21. Remember what we said at the beginning of, of this morning's sermon. Everything that David says about the earthly Jerusalem and the house of God in this psalm speaks of the church in this life and public worship and ultimately of the new Jerusalem that God, where God will dwell with us with his people and be our God and we will be his people. And remember, New Jerusalem, it's a place, but it's a people. It's not just a place. It's the place where God dwells with his people and they will be his people.
people and he will be their God. That's what makes heaven heaven. That's what makes heaven so something to look forward to and long for is it we'll, we'll see Christ and be made like him. We'll be with God and dwell with him forever. May God work in us what is pleasing in his sight that you and I might look forward more and more to public worship together that we might more and more by his spirit have a sincere love for his church and because of that we might grow and have a longing more and more of a longing for heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you that it, it reminds us, it, it uh, tunes our hearts to sing your grace. It tunes our hearts more and more and fits us for heaven. It uh, teaches us to love uh, your worship on your day in your house. It teaches us to love your church that you shed your blood uh, to purchase and acquire for yourself to be a people for your own possession. And, and it teaches us in so many ways, even at the end of your word in Revelation, to have a longing for heaven. Lord, we have, uh, in this life, uh, we have mourning and tears and death and pain. And one day we look forward to that day when we'll have none of those things, but we'll have unending joy. We'll have worship that's un, unimpaired, unimpeded, unlimited uh, by the things that get in our way in this life. We thank you that one day all these signs and symbols, the, uh, even at the Lord's Supper it, that looks so insignificant to the, to the naked eye that one day we will see the great reality that these things represent when we're with you forever in heaven. Uh, Lord, we look forward to that day. We can't begin to imagine what it will be like. You, you tell us that uh, no eye has seen or uh, no one has imagined what you have prepared for those who love you uh, one day. And, and Lord, we ask that you would change our hearts by your spirit. Fill us with your spirit, that we might more and more look forward to worship, love your church, and long for heaven. And Lord, we ask if anybody does not yet know you here, if, if those who are here or, or listening at home, if they are still in their sins and still uh, outside of Christ and, and, and await your wrath, we pray that you would convert them even now. Open their eyes, let them see their sin for what it is. We pray that they would flee the wrath to come by faith in Christ, and, and faith in him and pray that you grant them repentance and faith and salvation in Christ that they too might uh, come to worship with your people and love your church of which they are a part and long with a real hope for heaven and we ask all these things in Christ's name and for his glory amen Once again, we, because of circumstances going on with uh, the coronavirus and whatnot, all the recommendations they've made, we've got the bread in separate containers, so nobody has to worry about touching someone else's bread or whatnot. So, uh, the, the the cup, the center two rings are wine. The outside ring is grape juice for those who have a conscience against uh, wine. But um, I feel like I already kind of said the initial thing about the Lord's Supper and the end of, towards the end of the sermon. Like this, these things are a foretaste of heaven. Um, if you ask, what is the Lord's Supper about? What are we doing when we do this little cup of, of wine and little piece of bread? Uh, we're communing with Christ. We're not doing, we don't see his face. It's not physically. You don't, we're not eating Christ's body and, and drinking his blood physically. Uh, we're doing it spiritually by the work of the Spirit and, and by faith. The, the sign is a sign of, of you know, the, the bread. We often ask at our membership interviews, what is the bread and the cup? What do they signify? What do they represent? And what does the bread represent? Christ's body broken for us. What does the cup represent? His blood shed for our sins. In fact, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 11? I think it's verse 27. When, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, what are you doing? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a reminder uh, over and over again, even one that you can touch and taste, not just see, that Christ died for our sins to save, to save us from our sins. That, that this, in a lot of ways, this is kind of the, the pinnacle of Christian worship. It's a reminder of, of the most important thing of the Christian faith is that Christ died for sinners. 
But the price for our salvation is, you know, was Christ's death on our behalf. And so we, if you're a Christian this morning, we invite you to partake of the bread and the cup with us, the, the Lord's Supper. You don't have to be a member of our church in particular. Uh, if you're not a Christian this morning, if you're here and you're not a believer, we ask that you let the cup and the bread uh, pass you by. Because Paul does, Paul does warn about these things. He says, you know, if someone takes and eats the, the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner, not not discerning the body, the body of the Lord, uh, he eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Again, it doesn't look like anything impressive or important to the, to the naked eye, uh, but this is communion with Christ in heaven. We are, in a sense, communing with him. He's at the right hand of God, and by the work of the Spirit, we are communing with him as we take the bread and, and drink the cup. Well, let's, let's pray this morning that God might bless this means of grace to us today. Heavenly Father, the God of grace and, and mercy and love, we thank you for uh, the fact that you know that we are dust. You know, you know our frame. You remember that we're dust. You know how weak we are. You know how weak our faith is. And we often, as the man in the New Testament said, Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. And uh, we thank you that you've given us this, this sacrament of the Lord's Supper to do just that, to help our unbelief, to strengthen us in, the, in our faith, to give us a strong assurance of your great love for us, uh, and so we ask that once again you would work in us by your spirit, that you would sanctify these, these uh, signs, uh, the bread and the cup, to us, that you would uh, make them useful to us. Give us the eyes of faith and the hands of faith to take the bread and the cup in a way that uh, we look to you by faith and have our faith strengthened, our assurance of your great love for us in Christ's strength. And that just as surely as we see the bread and the cup, just as certainly as that, we might be reassured that Christ really did die on the cross, really did have his body broken for us, and really did shed his blood for our salvation, Lord. And, and Lord, we ask that you'd work in us that just as surely as we taste and, and eat the bread and, and drink this cup, that just as surely as that, that you nourish us by your Holy Spirit, uh, by the body and blood of Christ for eternal life, that you would strengthen our assurance of your love for us and our assurance of your great forgiveness for all of our sins in Christ. We thank you that you loved us enough to send him to do that, to die in our place, that we might have salvation from our sins, and not just a lack of hell, but that one day we will look forward to the great marriage supper of the Lamb uh, and be with you forever in the new Jerusalem. We thank you for that, Lord, and we ask that you would make us grow in your grace, that we might go forth from this place this morning, equipped and built up in the faith, that we might go forth walking more and more in newness of life in a way that glorifies you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, in 1 Corinthians uh, 11, Paul says, uh, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Paul goes on and says, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you condescend to our weakness, that you give us your word, which should be enough, but you also give us on top of that the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper to strengthen us in our faith, to make us grow in your grace. And we pray that you would give us grace to do just that, that we would grow in our faith by the work of your spirit, that we would grow in our assurance of your love for us, and that through the joy of that we might look forward more and more to worship, that we might be uh, living more and more in a way that is glorifying to the name of Christ as salt and light here in our town. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn this morning, if I can invite you to stand for it. It's number 562, and it's called Lord Dismiss Us With Your Blessing. And we're going to sing it to an alternate tune, uh, which is found on number 313, in case that, uh, if you're curious about that. But we're going to sing it to a different tune. Uh, the tune is Regent Square. But 562, Lord Dismiss Us With Your Blessing.
Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you all. Amen. Amen. Amen.